please make welcome Melbourne Press Club Life member Mike Smith. Thanks, Michael, uh, Corey, and Steve, and uh, Perkin Award winners and um, and guests. Um, at this stage of the evening, I, I feel like I'm ploughing paddocks that have already been well tilled. Um, I've been busy uh, filleting my notes all evening. There's nothing worse in an audience of journalists than telling stories that are that are old. But the great thing about the Graham Perkins story is that the the uh, the soil is so fertile that there's always more to say. A few people have asked why uh, we're celebrating the 40th anniversary of Graham's death. Uh, why not wait until the 50th, the gold one? And I think the answer is we couldn't be sure that either the paper or half the audience <laughs> would still be around in another 10 years, <laughs> or at least in their present form. Uh, like, like Neil Mitchell, uh, I was a teenager when, um, when we walked together. We went up in the lift together into Graham Perkins' newsroom in, in 1969. We were... We, I think, we were like two schoolboy rookies joining a champion football club and being carried to ten premierships in a row. The age was nearing its peak. Uh, Martin Walker's book would nominate the age amongst the 12 great and influential papers in the world. Later, Columbia University would list the age as one of the top 20 papers in the world multiple times. A local survey nominated The Age as the most influential institution in Melbourne and the editor of The Age as the third most influential individual. I was, I was only 24 when, when Perkin died. I often wondered whether my perspective on Perkin was distorted through the lens of a starry-eyed youth. But nothing I've heard or read in the past 40 years has diminished his reputation in my eyes, indeed the opposite. The more I learn, the more I admire him. The best thing I can say about him is that he was a capital L leader. He wasn't just an editor or just a manager. He was a real leader. Look up any text on the qualities of a good leader and you won't find one that Perkin didn't have. Perkin, by the way, went to management school while he was being groomed for, uh, for higher office, and it didn't spoil him. <laughs> to, to, to us kids, he was, um, he was like a, a captain coach you'd be prepared to run through brick walls for. He brought out the best in a great team of creative people, and he didn't do it alone. Like Hawthorne, he had a terrific core of experienced, battle-hardened, main event performers. Some of them are in this room. He had a wonderful defence protecting him, and sometimes he needed it. He had a number of reliable goal kickers and a couple of entertaining and flashy flankers. You know the type I mean. And that gave him the freedom to throw a few kids into the midfield a while for a while to see if they had the goods. As a young roundsman or beat reporter... Uh, ministers and heads of departments would call you in the evenings just because you were from the age. Sometimes they had conflicting messages on the same issue. And Perkin himself was everywhere, morning, noon and night, shouting praise or abuse at reporters and subs across the newsroom, rewriting copy, writing headlines, polishing editorials, sizing up pictures. There was nothing he couldn't do as well or better than anyone on the paper. Yeah, he was a man for the times, and they were very, very different times to now, but maybe not so different. They were times of powerful and charismatic editors here and in America and in England. They had real authority. They had the real authority to lead. They were given permission to lead. They were times when newspapers had to rise to the challenge of television and radio. And new entrants like the classy national new paper, the, the Australian. They had to change and improve. They were the post-Vietnam times when the readers were ready for new ideas, new ways of thinking, new issues. The gift of a great editor is to be slightly ahead of community opinion. 
Not so far ahead that you lose touch and can't bring the community with you, and certainly not behind public opinion. Perkin was able to find that sweet spot. They were the times of Watergate, when nothing seemed impossible for good newspapers and good journalism. Perkin wasn't infallible, he made mistakes. When we witnessed or learned about his flaws, it made him more endearing, somehow more interesting. When Perkin was being groomed for leadership, he travelled overseas frequently. He was mightily impressed with the Sunday Times and Harold Evans. So he bought the Sunday Times service, including its insight reports. Early scoops included the thalidomide scandal and the Kim Philby spy ring. Then Perkin decided in 1967 to set up his own team under the same insight banner. Ben Hill's book traces the early insight stories admirably. If you, it's the only recommended reading for uh, Perkin's role in investigative journalism. Two young reporters were assigned to launch the local insight, John Larkin and John Tidy, who's, who's here tonight. Perkin was scornful of the 45-minute news feature based on two phone calls, 10 minutes in the library, three puns, the obligatory piece of alliteration, an old joke and a cute intro. When Perkin explained the insight concept to readers, he didn't even use the term investigative reporting. That description didn't really come into vogue until it was glamorised in the Watergate era. Perkin talked about reporters taking the time to have a deeper look at news, news that had escaped attention or proper attention in the daily news cycle. The first insight was a detailed look at Sir Henry Bolte's dream to turn Western Port Bay into the greatest industrial development in Victoria's history, including a nuclear reactor. It didn't happen. Then followed other investigations into forbidden subjects, like the venereal disease epidemic, abortion and suicide, and the use of amphetamines by truck drivers. The biggest story in the early days of Insight arose from an environmental issue. Perkin had appointed Australia's first environment reporter, John Messer, who became interested in local anger at state government plans to open up 80,000 hectares of native vegetation in the Little Desert, not far from Perkin's birthplace. Messer discovered that a planned 25 kilometre sealed road into the Little Desert, built at taxpayer expense, would coincidentally finish up on the doorstep of one of the relatives of the Minister for Lands, Sir William MacDonald, who was responsible for the Little Desert project. Perkins splashed it on the front page and ran a scathing editorial. Sir Henry Baldy that morning described it as the lowest, filthiest piece of journalism I've ever seen in my life. The project was scuttled and the Minister MacDonald lost his seat at the next election. Uh, next came the exposure of land developer and former Lord Mayor Sir Bernard Evans, who had bought up land near Melbourne's underground railway stations. The sites for the stations had been chosen by a council committee he chaired. Conflict of interest entered the language, and Melbourne's would-be 20th century land boomers were on notice. Under, under Ben Hill's insight got rid of a corrupt Victorian public solicitor, and exposed how the chairman of the Board of Works, then the Supreme Planning Authority, had stood to profit from a rezoning of his land in Warrenbite. Mining department officials were exposed for taking bribes for granting mining leases. The term secret commissions entered the lexicon. Inside exposed the Hamer government's Housing Commission land deals, which was the tipping point for the Liberals losing government. Those exposures claimed the scalps of two Victorian ministers and a federal treasurer, as well as a number of public servants. Perhaps the, uh, the signature campaign, and Perkins last, was the Minus Children, the long and relentless investigation to get justice for the intellectually disabled children 
who lived in scandalous conditions at Kew Cottages. When the government responded sympathetically but did not act quickly enough, Perkins set up a campaign to raise the money through the paper. The government eventually matched the money dollar for dollar and then some. Well before that victory was won, one of the roadblocks was the responsible minister, the Minister health for Health, Mr Alan Scanlon. Alan Scanlon was probably the most incompetent minister of the 1970s. He was uh, part of my beat on the medical round at the time and several times Perkin would pass my desk muttering, hey Smith, what do you got? That Scanlon clown has got to go. I sensed he was looking for ammunition. <laughs> it, it, it was never hard to find. <laughs> in, in the summer of 74, there was an outbreak of Murray Valley encephalitis in northern Victoria, only the third in the 20th century. It would eventually hit 40 people with serious brain inflammations, killing eight of them. At the height of the epidemic, doctors were telling me the government was underplaying the epidemic possibly to avoid damage to the tourist industry in the middle of summer along the Murray. Uh, I rang Sir McFarlane Burnett. He was a Nobel Prize winner in immunology and the man who named the disease 25 years earlier. I thought he was a good authority. And he, he, he told me that the, um, the epidemic was entirely predictable and should have been foreshadowed in that year because of some research two of his colleagues had done years ago that uh, described the preconditions that um, caused this epidemic that was based in mosquitoes that came from ducks that came to that area because it rained too much further north. It's complicated, but that's basically it. So I published this story uh, from McFarlane Burnett saying, um, you know, they should have known. Um, Scanlon, the minister, rang me the next day and attacked the Nobel Prize winner, prize winner's scientific integrity. <laughs> and he even said he would rename the disease to distance it from the Murray Valley area. <laughs> Burnett's response was elegant and piercing. He simply said, my withers are unrun. <laughs> Perkins' response was more violent. Another excoriating editorial and another exhibit in the case for Scanlon's political demise, which happened not too long after. Often I wonder what Perkin would do if he was running a paper now. There's, there's, there's no question he was, he was an innovator and had a huge appetite and knack for successfully applying what worked overseas. I've got no doubt he would have seen the internet as an opportunity, not just a threat. Uh, he would have seen it early. He would have been up to his armpits in meeting the challenge. Along with his advertising and marketing people, there was a shared philosophy amongst those three arms of the paper that if you provided quality, the readers and the advertisers would follow. The only question is whether today's impatient shareholders would have given him the time to do it. If uh, Perkin was a reader of the age today and I guess online delivery makes it slightly less improbable than it was before. The, the thing you'd be most pleased about would be the paper's continuing commitment to investigative reporting. It's probably his most important legacy. He resuscitated muckraking in Melbourne proudly, courageously and relentlessly. He would enjoy working with Nick McKenzie, Richard Baker, Adele Ferguson, Michael Bachelard, Royce Miller and the others. He wouldn't be able to help himself polishing their copy, tightening it up and giving it a stronger pulse. He would write the headlines and back them on television and radio and in court. And I suspect he would tell them to look a little harder at the huge property development that is disturbing the, disturbing the final years of some of the minor's children at Kew Cottages. The development lobbied into the state Labor government by Graham Richardson and funded by some of Australia's most prominent businessmen. Thank you. Thank you.